Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back here. Uh, this is my 900th visit to this stage. Uh, and I spent a lot more time in the audience. Uh, I always uh, begin all my talks here at the Y uh, with the same uh, admonition to myself that I should try to be brief, because uh, I know 90 Sex Street Y people, and you, you didn't come here to hear me speak. You came here to hear yourself speak. Um, so I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll try to get out of the way of you. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, some things personal and some things national, which I think are connected. Uh, and my basic theme is going to be that the, a lot of the pain we see in the society, a lot of the pain in the, found, in the politics of our society are really rooted in something at the foundation of society, in a relational crisis, in a moral crisis, uh, and a sociological crisis. Now, we could tell this story from many levels, and I've often talked about the external level. I'll tell you my life story at the external level, the, the normal level we have conversations in. I grew up in Stuyvesant Town uh, down here. Uh, when I was six, my parents took me to a bee-in in Central Park. Uh, it was sort of in the late 60s. My parents were somewhat on the left, and hippies would go just to bee. Uh, and they threw their wallets into a garbage can uh, and then uh, set it on fire to demonstrate their liberation from money and material things. Uh, and I was five, and I saw a $5 bill on fire in the garbage can, so I reached into the fire, grabbed the money, and ran away. <laughs> and that was my first step over to the right. Um, <laughs> and then when I was seven, I read a book called Paddington the Bear uh, and decided I wanted to become a writer. Uh, and I remember in high school, I wanted to date this woman named Bernice, and she didn't want to date me. Uh, she wanted to date some other guy, and I remember thinking, what is she thinking? I write way better than that guy. And so we had different values. Um, and then when I was 18, the admissions officers at Columbia, Wesleyan, and Brown decided I should go to the University of Chicago. Um, uh, uh, which, uh, my favorite saying about Chicago, it's a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. And so that, um, and so I was pretty studious. Um, I majored in uh, history and celibacy while I was there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I had the big break of my life. Uh, William F. Buckley came to campus, and I wrote a ruthless parody of him in the campus newspaper. It was like, uh, while at Yale, Buckley founded two magazines, one called the National Buckley and one called the Buckley Review, which he merged to form the Buckley Buckley, uh, was all that sort of thing. And he, at the end of his talk, he said, David Brooks, if you're in the audience, I want to give you a job. And that literally happened. That was uh, the big break of my life. Sadly, I wasn't in the audience. Um, <laughs> I was actually having a weird, another weird experience. Back then, I was a sort of field a pre-burn. Uh, I was a socialist, uh, and I was on TV in Stanford debating Milton Friedman on TV. It was a show where Milton Friedman talks to the young. You can go on YouTube and see a 21-year-old David Brooks with these gigantic glasses that look like they're on loan from the Mount Palomar Lunar Observatory. There was just dying. Uh, you need squeegees to clean those things. Um, but eventually, I took Buckley up on the offer, and he became my mentor. And so then there's sort of the story of external success. Uh, and I've had a very fortunate life. I became a conservative columnist at the New York Times, which is, I always joke, it's a job I liken to being the chief rabbi at Mecca, uh, not a lot of company. And then I got the great chance to be on the news hour uh, with Mark Shields. Uh, and Mark, um, <laughs> Mark is truly a lovely man, and we've off seen He's just what he, you see. He's a truly lovely man. And we at the News Hour, uh, again, a little cerebral. Uh, we cater to what we call seasoned youth. That's our demographic. Um, so if a 93-year-old lady walks up to me in the airport, I know what she's going to say. I don't watch your show, but my mother loves it. Uh, and so um, very big in the hospice community there. Um, and then my books. Um, and as I've gotten older, I've tried to get a little softer, maybe a little more feminine. I'm the only American man who finished that book, Eat, Pray, Love, if you remember that book. Uh, by page 123, I was lactating, which was surprising. Um, and then I wrote a book uh, four years ago called The Road to Character. And I learned writing that book um, that writing a book on character doesn't give you good character. And even reading a book on character doesn't give you good character. But buying a book on character does give you good character. And so I <laughs> recommend that. And so that's the normal story of my life, which I've told from this stage bits and pieces before. But there's another understory, which is the story of the internal life. And if we think about it, our internal lives doesn't always queue up with our external life. The, the internal life story is often extremely more complicated. 
And so I mentioned Paddington the Bear. I actually went back a year or two ago and read and bought Paddington the Bear. And I was sort of shocked by its intensity because it's about this lost solitary bear who's trapped at a train station and no one loves him. And then he's come from Peru and then a family takes him in. So it goes from solitude to total taken in, belonging. And I was sort of shocked by that, like wh what kind of kid was I that this story was the one that occurred to me? And then as I was reading it, I remembered the intensity, the reaction I had the first time. And it's one of those moments where we have in life, in this book I call them enunciation moments, things that happen early in life that prefigure a lot of what comes later. And so for me, that's, I discovered writing. And I've probably written every day except for maybe 250 years since. And in this book, I talk about a great scientist named E.O. Wilson, who also had his enunciation moment when he was seven. His family was divorcing. He, uh, uh, he, they sent him off on the summer to a place called Paradise Beach in North Florida, and he, with a family he didn't know. And so he walked along the beach. He spent the, the whole time walking along the beach, searching and dreaming and seeing things he'd never seen before. He'd never seen a jellyfish. He wrote, the creature was astonishing. It existed outside my previous imagination. He was sitting on the dock one day and a stingray went underneath him. And he remembered that as a child, things looked twice as big as they do it for an adult. He said, I was thunderstruck and immediately seized by the need to see this again, to capture it and examine it. And so he was sort of awed. He was losing one world, his family, but he found this new world. And he just was awed. And he wrote, writes, in his memoir, a child comes to the edge of deep water with a mind prepared for wonder. And so the interesting thing is, is you, you're losing something and gaining something, but it's interesting at these moments of our life that are intense is how aesthetic they are. There's a sense of beauty, a beautiful thing which just calls us. The Greek word for beauty is related to the word for call. It calls us in and we sort of just know. When Einstein was four, his dad, and he stayed home from sick one day from school, and his dad gave him a compass. And he looked at the needle moving, f pulled by invisible forces. And at four, he said, there are invisible forces in the universe. And he spent the rest of his life studying that. I read about a painter who was asked, I think by Annie Dillard, how did you go into painting? And she just said, I love the smell of paint. It's just that aesthetic sensation. And so E.O. Wilson had that moment. But there was another moment he was going to be a naturalist. There was another moment in that summer which affected everything. He was fishing when he got really used to the ocean and he pulled a pinfish out and it f flapped into his face and the tail fin poked his retina. And he was so much in love with the water he didn't want to go home so he stayed out all day in pain and finally went blind in that eye. So he couldn't do anything that required stereoscopy, the two visions. So he couldn't be a naturalist of birds and he couldn't be fish but he could, be, couldn't, he could be a naturalist with something you could hold up to his one good eye. And so he did ants. And he became a great scientist. He's probably in his 80s. And so there was the intensity of that moment. And then the second thing that happened to him, which I think is also crucial in kids, is that moment of admiration. I remember living down in Stytown and looking at the teenagers when I was a kid, and they were like gods to me, <laughs> the way they walked. And for him, he, uh, Wilson, he had a mentor named Philip Darlington. And Darlington was a professor, and he taught him to, when you collect bug samples, don't go on the trails, walk through the jungle. And there was a moment when he was, Darlington was floating in the Amazon on a log to pick up some samples, and a crocodile came out of the water, grabbed him, and dragged him down. And he escaped, and the crocodile came again and dragged him down. He escaped again, pulled himself on land, and his whole right side was shredded. He dragged himself to a hospital and lived. But that wasn't what impressed Wilson. What, what impressed Wilson was for the next six months in a body cast, his own arm de demobilized, he collected samples one-handed. And I think that's what our mentors do to us. They remind us that something is hard, but worthy of the hardness. And what young people want is that intensity, not necessarily happiness, they want intensity. And they want to be held up to an adequate ideal and often moral failure is not weakness of, category, of character, it's just an inadequate idea. And so you have these moments of intensity early in life. Uh, and then we go through life, and sometimes culture tries to sap that out of us. And I think the game, the game that we get trapped in, for some of us and for privileged people, it starts with the college admissions process. 
a process that puts status and achievement at the center of your life. And then you get sucked into the meritocracy. And the meritocracy has a bunch of lies. The first lie is that career success will make you feel fulfilled. I remember, and, and this, as anybody who's achieved success knows, this is not true. I remember when I, my first book, Bobo's in Paradise, came out, and it, I got a call, I was driving in Los Angeles, and I got a call that it had made the New York Times bestseller list. And I remember that instant feeling exactly nothing and being shocked at how little it felt. And that's because whatever that career success that was out there, it really didn't affect me. The second lie is that I can make myself happy. That if I just win one more victory or lose 15 more pounds or do more yoga, I can be happy. And this is the lie of self-sufficiency, that I can do this on my own. But I think if you talk to people who are on their deathbeds or most of us in the audience who've had some experience, happiness is not self-sufficiency. Happiness is defeating self-sufficiency and being in mutual dependence with another person. It's the giving and extending of care. But the, we get individualized in our individualistic culture. The third lie is that life is an individual journey. This is if you ever see that book, Oh, the Places You'll Go, that you just sort of rack up experiences. And if you pay attention to that lie, you can rack up a lot of experiences, but your life won't accumulate to anything because you're not really planted and committed to something. The fourth lie is you have to find your own truth. This is the lie of commencement talks. I, I spend a lot of time thinking about commencement talks because it's the only sermon we have left. And universities usually hire phenomenally successful people to give speeches saying that success doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, and then they um, give speeches saying failure is great. And from that, you learn that failure is really great if you happen to be J.K. Rowling. Um, <laughs> for most people, failure sucks. But what they do is they say, you d what's the source of authority? Look inside yourself, follow your passion, find yourself, you do you, find your true passion. For most of us, the, the answers aren't there. The values and the moral values we have, and Jews don't need to be reminded of this, are not something we create in individually. They're something we create in groups. There are communities, our religions, our institutions that contain values that we absorb and then debate. If you tell somebody, find your own value system, and your name is Aristotle, fine, you can do it. Most of us can't do it. And then there's the meritocracy itself, which is of our city. The message of the meritocracy is that you are what you accomplish. The message of the meritocracy is you can win dignity by attaching yourself to prestigious brands, your prestigious school, your prestigious company. The emotion of the meritocracy is conditional love. I need to win su success to earn love. The sociology of the meritocracy is society is divided into inner rings where the successful people are and less successful people. And the poison of the meritocracy, even though we pretend we don't believe this, the message of the meritocracy very often is that people who are smarter and more accomplished are worth more than everyone else. And what this does, I think, is lessen the intensity, turn off the mo moral switch that we used to react to the world with. You may have heard this experiment. There were Israeli daycare centers, and all the parents were showing up late. And so they decided to get the parents not to show up late. They would impose fines on lateness. The number of parents showing up late doubled because what had previously been a moral decision, am I making the teachers inconvenienced, suddenly became an economic decision, which they were willing to pay for. So what had been once a relationship turned into a transaction, a moral responsibility turned into utilitarian shift. It's moral numbing, it's closing the moral lens, picking up the transactional lens. And my, in my view, that way of life, which our society often encourages, is not sustainable. You see people who fail. Sometimes people achieve success. They get to the top of the first mountain of career, and they look around, and they find it unsatisfying. It wasn't all I thought it would be. Some people fail. Their company collapses. They get fired. Some people get knocked sideways by something that wasn't part of the original plan, cancer, scare, loss of a child. And they're in the valley. And to me, this has been a bit of the story of the internal side of my life. The external side has been like a straight up. I've been lucky. But internally, there have been a lot of ups and downs. Now, it should be said, when you go to and talk to a writer, you're talking to somebody who's probably solitary by nature. 
when I tell, meet journalism students, I say, if you're at a football game and everybody's doing the wave and you don't do the wave, then you have the right kind of aloof personality style to be a, a journalist. <laughs> um, I, I like Gary Shandling's line, my friends tell me I have an intimacy problem, but they don't really know me. <laughs> um, so then you, you start out with an aloof personality type. You probably have a little, the profession encourages loneliness and solitude. So John Cheever lived not far from here, and he, I think it was Park Avenue, and he would get up uh, in the morning, put on a suit and tie, take the elevator down to the basement of his building where he had to study. He would take off the suit and tie. He'd write in his boxers. Then at 12.30, he'd put back on the suit and tie, ride the elevator up, and have lunch. That's the life of a writer. And then, on you, if you succeed, it becomes even more weirdly lonely-making. My last book did well commercially, and I had a book tour that went on forever, and I counted in the middle of it 42 meals that I ate alone at a hotel, airport, or airplane. And I was totally unmoored from all my bearings. And around that time, Britney Spears sort of went berserk and shaved off all her hair. And I was like, yeah, I get that. I could do that. <laughs> and so when you get sucked up into the system, the first thing in my case was I really cared a lot about reputation. I am what the world thinks I am. And second, and more po poisonous, I came to idolize time over people. Everything was about productivity and efficiency. So around about 2013, when everything looked normal on the outside, more or less, I was in the ditch. And the wages of sin are sin. And so my marriage had ended, my kids were leaving home. I used to be part of the conservative movement, but conservatism was really shifting from something I thought was true. And so I, I got out of that work. I had a lot of work friends, but I had no weekend friends. And what, how I responded to the sense of loneliness and failure and humiliation, which ar arose as a kind of burning in the stomach, was I tried to work my way through it. Workaholism is a great cure for, or a great way to avoid any emotional and spiritual problem. And I was living in an apartment in DC, and I never cooked, I never entertained, I never did the things that women bring into a home like flowers and candles. Um, and if you open my kitchen drawer, uh, where the silverware was, should have been, there were post-it notes. Where the plates should have been, there were envelopes and stationery. And I was just working. Uh, and what I learned, I learned a few things. They say you, um, well, I should say before that, that as I was drifting into disconnection, a lot of other people in this country were too, and for the exact same reason, that we had a culture that doesn't encourage us to get close to one another. And a lot of things that happened to me in life, the secret of my career is that a lot of things that happened to me ha are happening to a lot of other people at the same time. I'm a very average person with above average communication skills. And so you looked around the country and suddenly you saw isolation and division. 35% of Americans over 55 are chronically lonely. 55% of Americans say no one knows them well. Only 8% of Americans report having important conversations with their neighbors. The fastest growing political party is unaffiliated. The fastest growing religious movement is unaffiliated. The suicide rate since 1999 is up 30%. Among those 10 to 17, the suicide rate is up 70%. 45,000 Americans kill themselves every year, 72,000 die of opiate addiction. The American lifespan is shrinking, not expanding, because of these deaths of despair. And so that's a society just not connected to itself. Second, distrust. If you ask people, do you trust the institutions of your society, it used to be 70, 80% said, yeah, I trust my institutions. Now that's 32%. If you ask people, do you trust the neighbors, the people around you, it used to be 60%. Now we're down to 22% and like 15% of millennials. The younger you go, the more distrusting people are. Then there's a spiritual crisis. Given all we know about the brain, it's amazing to me that mental health problems are sharply rising, not falling. Depression rates sharply rising, not falling. I see it in my st students. They come here, something bad happens, and they crater. I call it the telos crisis. They don't want to know what their purpose is. And Nietzsche says, he who has a why to live for can endure anyhow. If you know why you were put on this earth, you can handle the setbacks. But if you don't know your why, then life really falls apart. And so we've lost a love of each other. We've lost a love of who we are as a people. And we've lost that assumed optimism about the future. And that, to me, is a social, moral, and spiritual problem. So I've spent a lot of time 
both personally and sociologically as a pundit, thinking if you're in the valley, how do you get out of the valley? And the good thing is, as the Greeks used to say, you suffer your way to wisdom. And when I was down in the valley in 2013, having that really bad, mostly summer and fall, I made a few realizations. The first thing I realized is that freedom sucks. Political freedom is good, economic freedom is pretty good, personal freedom is terrible. If you're unattached, you're unremembered. And you ha it, freedom is not an ocean you want to swim in for your life, it's a river you want to get across so you can plant yourself with people on the other side. The second thing I learned is that you can be broken or you can be broken open by these bad moments. And really, a, a friend of mine who's 94 said, your life is defined by how you react to your moment of greatest adversity. And we all know people who've been broken open, or been broken. They get smaller, they shrink, they get fearful, they're afraid, they often nurse grievances and resentments toward the world. As the saying goes, pain that is not transformed gets transmitted. And those, we see the tribalism all around in our society. That's people who've been broken by anxiety. And so they have the zero sum mindset, they have a scarcity mentality, it's always us versus them, your tribe against mine, politics is war, let's build walls, let's erect barriers. But other people get broken open. That smashes the shell of ego and they reveal something deeper below. Paul Tillich, um, the 1950s theologian, said that what happens in moments of suffering is that pain reminds you you're not the person you thought you were. That it carves through what you thought was the basement of the floor of your soul and reveals a cavity below, then it carves through that floor and reveals a cavity below. And when you feel that much, and when you see that deep into yourself, you realize that only spiritual and emotional food is gonna fill those cavities. And so you become aware of the depthness. You, you, the ego fades away a little, and you become aware of the pain of your heart, the desires of your heart. A lot of us, especially middle-aged white guys, are emotionally avoidant, but it's hard to be emotionally avoidant when you're in it. And what the heart yearns for is contact and fusion with one another. The kind of fusion that Louis de Bernier described in his book, Captain Corelli's Mandolin. In that book, he's got an old guy talking to his daughter about his relationship with his late wife. And the guy says, love itself is what is left over when being in love is burned away. And this is both an art and a fortunate accident. Your mother and I had it. We had roots that grew towards each other underground. And when all the pretty blossoms had fallen from our branches, we found out that we were one tree and not two. And that's, a lot of, that's what the heart yearns for. The second thing you discover down there is your soul. Now, I don't ask you to believe in God or not believe in God. There are other people in that building who are in that department. But I do believe that there's a piece of you that has no size, shape, color, or weight, but it gives you infinite value and dignity. That rich and successful people don't have more of this and poorer, less successful, old people not more than young. And it's the soul. Slavery is wrong because it's an attempt to obliterate another person's soul. Rape is not just an attack on a bunch of physical molecules, it's an attempt to insult another person's soul. Obscenity is anything that covers over a soul. And what the soul does is it yearns for righteousness. I've interviewed a lot of people in this world who are really bad, murderers, people who led war crimes. I've never been a person who didn't want to lead a good life. Even the bad people have some rationalization about why what they did was good. The soul yearns for a life of goodness and meaning, and it yearns to, service in, in, to live in service with some ideal, the kind of service that Rabbi Wolf Kelman described when he marched in Selma with Martin Luther King. He wrote afterwards, we felt connected in song to the transcendental, to the ineffable. We felt triumph and celebration. We felt that things change for the good and nothing is congealed forever. That was the warmest, most transcendental spiritual experience. Meaning and purpose and mission were beyond exact words. Meaning was the feeling, the song, the moment of overwhelming spiritual fulfillment. That's a soul alive and inflamed. Now, when I went through that dark time, the third thing I realized was, it was an Einstein formulation. He said, the problem you have is not gonna be created at the same level of consciousness at which you created it. You're gonna ha have to sink deeper down into yourself and think in a different way. There's a, a parable in the Jewish tradition where Moses has uh, fled into exile and he's a shepherd. 
and there's a little lamb who is, uh, escapes from the flock and starts running away like a gazelle. And Moses is chasing him, and r lambs usually don't run like gazelles. But he chases him deeper and deeper into the wilderness. And the rabbis teaches us that the lamb was Moses himself. He had to go deeper into the wilderness to find out who he was. And that's true in these dark moments. A lot of the times you just want to throw yourself on your friends. You're so lonely, any social encounter will do. But there also has to be time in the wilderness to, as they say, listen to your life. And when you do that, you find yourself going deeper into yourself than you ever imagined. And I think what you find there is a human ability to care that you didn't realize existed. I have a friend named Catherine Clox who said when her first daughter was born, she realized she loved her more than evolution required. And I've always liked that because it suggests that extra layer of mystical care that we have for one another. Annie Dillard put it beautifully. In the deeps are the violence and terror of which psychology has warned us. But if you ride these monsters deeper down, if you drop with them further over the world's rim, you find what our sciences cannot locate or name, the substrate, the ocean or matrix or ether which buoys all the rest, which gives goodness its power for good, evil its power for evil, the unified field, our complex and inexplicable caring for one another. And I just emphasize that last phrase, our inexplicable caring for one another. When you go down into yourself, you find a highway right out of self, the desires of the heart for others, the desires of the soul for some good. And when you make that realization, you realize that life is bigger and more enchanted and more surprising than you could have ever imagined earlier in your life. And then the next stage of getting out of the mountain, that, that's what I think of falling in on yourself and touching your deepest piece of yourself. But the problem with the mountain or with being in the valley is that you can't pull yourself out on your own. Usually somebody has to reach in, some good person, and pull you out. And for me, there were a lot of things that happened. One of the things that happened in 2013, one Thursday night in the summer, I got invited over to a friend's house, or of someone I didn't know, but a friend invited me. And it was on a Thursday night, and it was in DC, and there was a couple there named Kathy and David who owned the house. And they had a kid in the DC public schools who had a friend named James whose mom had some health issues. And James d often didn't have a place to stay or food to eat at his home. So they said, James can stay with me, us. And so then James had a friend and that kid had a friend. And so the Thursday night in 2013 when I went over there for the first time, there were 40 kids around the dinner table and 15 sleeping in the basement. And I walk in there and I reach out my hand to shake a kid's hand to introduce myself. And he says, we don't really shake hands here. We just hug here. And I'm not the huggiest guy on the face of the earth, <laughs> but I've been going back every Thursday ever since. And I've been doing a lot of hugging. And what we do is we sit around the table, mostly kids then, they were in their 17, 18, 16, now they're about 21, 22, is we throw our stuff on the table before us. Sometimes it's a good thing a kid gets a job at a barber school, kids pass the GED. Sometimes it's really bad stuff, pregnancy, depression, one of the young ladies, uh, her kidney failed, and so David, the father figure in the family, gave her his kidney. And what the kids give us is a complete intolerance of social distance. They turn like to you, like just looking for love, and they pull love out of you, and they offer it to you. I took my daughter there once, Naomi, and she uh, said, that's the warmest place I've ever been. I took a friend of mine named Bill Milliken, who runs something called Communities and Schools, or started it. And he says, I've been doing youth work for 50 years. He's probably in his 70s. He said, I've never seen a program turn around a life. Only relationships turn around lives. And that's what's getting built here. And that really lifted me out. And the good news for the country is that there, it's, this community is called AOK. -OK. There are those people everywhere. I've started this project called the, the Weave Project uh, at the Aspen Institute. This is our logo. Um, and what we do is, th it's based on the idea that disconnection is the core problem here, but it's being solved on the local level all around the country. So how can we illuminate what they're doing and nationalize their effect? And I've spent the last year, almost constant travel, meeting the greatest people. There, I met a woman named Aisha Butler, who lives in the Englewood neighborhood of Chicago, and she was about to move out of Englewood, which is a tough neighborhood because it's so violent. Uh, and the day she was uh, about to move out, she looks across the street and there's two little girls at an empty lot playing with open bo broken bottles. 
she turns to her husband and says, we're not leaving that. We're not going to be just another family that left that. And so she Googles volunteer in Englewood, and she did one thing after another and then now created the biggest community group in Englewood. And she's planted her flag, she's devoted herself. A lot of these people that I met have had very bad valleys in their lives. Darius Baxter lives in D.C., his dad had an affair when he was, Darius was nine, and the mistress killed his dad. And so now Darius runs football programs in D.C. for young African-American men to have men in their lives. The worst case I came across in Ohio about four or five months ago, a woman named Sarah, she was out antiquing with her mom one weekend, and she came home Sunday afternoon, uh, and she, called, she entered the door and said, I'm home, heard nothing. Somebody had put a mattress uh, on the stairway going down to the basement. She thought they were playing hide and seek, so she runs down the stairs, and she sees her husband slumped over. Then she turns and sees her oldest boy on a couch covered what, what she thought was chocolate. And she touched him, and he was cold, and she had a vision of gold and heaven. Then she ran upstairs to see the younger son, and he was also cold. The, the man had killed the kids and himself. And she now runs a free pharmacy. She has a foundation for women that have suffered violence. She teaches at Ohio University. She leads a life of selfless service. She told me, I grew from this experience because I was angry. I was going to fight back against what he tried to do to me by making a difference in the world. See, he didn't kill me. My response to him is, whatever you meant to do to me, screw you. You're not going to do it to me. And so if the first mountain life is about the ego and career, these people are on their second mountain. They're not driven by the desire for status or power or money and certainly not celebrity. They have a moral motivation just to live right with each other and live right with the world. They have vocational certitude. They never say, yeah, I think I'll do this for a few more years and then try something else. They all say, this is why I was put on this earth. They're somewheres, not anywheres. They've planted themselves down in a community. I met a guy in Youngstown, Ohio, who just stands and stood in the park in Youngstown with a sign that said, defend Youngstown. They believe in radical mutuality. There's no high or low. We're all broken here. We're all walking this together. As a woman in New Orleans said to me, I don't do things for people. I do things with people. But at roots, they're deeply relational. Some of them have IQs that could get them into Harvard. But if Harvard admissions criteria was based on how good you are at relationship building, they'd all get into Harvard. There was a woman, there's a woman named Mary Gordon who runs a program called Roots of Empathy that teaches empathy. And the way they do it is they take a mom and like an 18-month-old and they bring them into a classroom with eighth graders and the kids have to watch the 18-month-old and try to envision what it's thinking. It's a habit that gets them putting themselves in the mind of another student, another human. In one of the classes there was a kid named Darren who was uh, bigger than everybody else because he uh, uh, had been held back. He'd been through the foster care system. He'd seen his mom killed. And he asked the mom if he could hold the infant, the baby. And the mom was scared because Darren looked scary. He was big. But she let him hold the baby, and the Darren was excellent with the baby. He just cradled him on his chest and then handed him back uh, and then started asking questions about parenting. And the final one was, if nobody has ever loved you, do you think you can be a good father? And so what Mary Gordon and Roots of Empathy is doing, they're reaching into the valley and they're pulling people up. And I met so many, and the, those who are affected are some who we think of in the valley. Those who are affected are some of us who should be on the mountaintop. One of my favorite programs is called Thread in Baltimore. It's really a program that builds networks around underperforming students. And there was a woman on the board there, a very successful financier. Uh, and Thread has an ethos of complete vulnerability, complete honesty, what they call showing up all the way or calling a thing a thing. And this ethos had this effect on this financier who was on the board. And her childhood had been rough. Her dad had abused her and punched her, and she's Asian American. And she used to say, I was glad I had thick black hair because no one could see the welts where he'd punched me. And she had never told her husband that. She had never told her kids. But she told the board at Thread because the ethos is, we are going to have a relationship of complete vulnerability here. And after she told the board, she decided sh I should tell my husband and I should tell my kids. And she allowed me to put her, a letter she wrote to her family in my book. 
And later in life, um, after she told them, she took her daughter to a concert, an Elton John concert. And Elton John was the soundtrack to the days when she was young, when she was attempting suicide. And she's there with her 13-year-old daughter, and she starts crying. And she wrote in that letter, I wasn't crying because I was sad. I was overcome by emotions as my mind whipsawed between the stark contrast of my bleak childhood and my splendid adult life. I was listening to his music with my 13-year-old daughter, both of us laughing. My life now is rich and strong with healthy relationships. Life has turned out to be so much better than I ever imagined. And so these are people who have been lifted out and are some, they've been turned into connection. Joseph Campbell said there were two kinds of heroes. There's heroes of deeds who do great things, but then there are spiritual heroes who find a better way to live. And these weavers that I've met, they found a better way to live. They're saying, we're not individualists, we're relationships. We live and die and are nourished by relationships. And they live in a different way, with a different lifestyle, with different values. And I've used this metaphor of for, for first mountain, second mountain. They're on the second mountain. The first mountain is about building up the ego and defining the self. The second mountain is about shedding the ego and losing the self. The first mountain is about acquisition. The second mountain is about contribution. The first mountain is elitist, it's climbing up. The second mountain is egalitarian, it's putting yourself out and reaching down. And some people are radically changed when they shift from one value system into another. They take new jobs, they go off and lead service organizations. A lot of people stay in the same jobs, but they behave differently. They see their work as a summons to build relationship. So for example, there's a story I read in a book called Practical Wisdom about a hospital janitor named Luke. And uh, Luke cleaned the rooms in a wing, and one, and one of the rooms had a kid who'd gotten into a fight and who was in a coma, which he was not coming out of. And his dad sat there for six months while Luke cleaned the room. But one day Luke cleaned the room and the father was out getting a smoke. And later in the day, the father came to Luke and said, you didn't clean my son's room. Now, the first mountain response would have been to say, well, my job is cleaning rooms. And so you'd snap at the father, I did clean this room. You were just out getting a smoke. But the second mountain mentality says, my job is to serve patients and their families. So what I should do is go and clean the room again so he can see me cleaning it. And that's what Luke did. And so you're celebrating, you're changing your whole perspective. And what you are doing is making a commitment, a commitment to another person, to a spouse and a family, to a vocation, a calling, to a philosophy or faith. You're making the kind of commitment that Ruth made to Naomi in the Bible. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. It's not a life based on freedom and keeping your options open. It's a life based on commitments and tying yourself down. And one of the nice things that I found in this year is that it's been kind of an ugly year <laughs> politically. But I found so many of these weavers, so many people li living by this better value system, and all we have to do is copy them. And there are millions of them. They're a movement that doesn't even know it's a movement. And the final thing what I notice about them is that a lot of us in life shoot for, um, we want to be happy. And happiness is great, I'm all for happiness. But uh, happiness is about winning victories in life. But when life is going your way, you're achieving your goals. And when you're happy, you're you're, you sort of swell outward. And you feel bigger. But these people don't live for that, they live for joy. And joy seems like happiness, but it's actually the opposite. At moments of joy, you transcend the self. You don't, it, when a mother is joyfully with her daughter, she doesn't know where she ends and the daughter begins. When a hiker is out in nature, you don't know where the you end, you end and, the, and nature begins. When a teacher is watching a student learn something, the skin barrier between them falls away. And the one thing I've learned on this trip is that happiness is great, but joy is better. And it's been such a heartening moment for me politically and personally, because change is gonna come at the bottom, as it says in the book of Job, as the sparks fly upward. And out there in re everyday America and even in our city, there are millions of people who found a better way to live with better values, 
that are about connection and relationship and service to some ideal. And all we have to do is organize ourselves together to make a big national change. Thank you. We have uh, mic runners, um, and all I ask is that you make your questions long and rambling with no question at the end. <laughs> I see one right here in the middle. Wow, you packed this. It was great. I'm, it, that would be an understatement. Thank you, David Brooks. I knew you mostly from the News Hour and from some of your books. Thank you. Um, my I relate in so many ways. I'm, I'm busting for, I, I will just say, um, <clears throat> to say we just have to organize or to, I, I fear that the bigger problem is, and maybe I'm listening or reading too much about like Noam Chomsky's theories and things about what the disparity that's already set up in our global existence is stopping. The people are always great. And frankly, I'm going to say this, the women are always great. They're at the forefront of every single movement. And many of us have been working in it for decades and doing so much on so many levels, um, personal and professional, but also volunteer. And I fear that no matter how much all of us do collectively, and, I, okay, um, how do we get through the barrier? It's almost like uh, what would we call uh, space, hitting the space wall or something. I fear that no matter how much all of us do collectively on the ground here, the systems in place are stopping it right. no matter what because disparity has to live in order for yeah. the powers that be to survive. Okay. I, I, have a th I have a theory, of course. Um, so I, I, Bob Putnam at Harvard, who's a great sociologist, likens this time to uh, uh, the late 1890s, that a time of economic transition, a uh, big sweep of immigration, a lot of political corruption, massive inequality. And by 1910, they solved some of their problems. And how did they do that? First, there was a shift culturally from social Darwinism, which was super individualistic and competitive, to the social gospel movement, which was very communal. And then in the 1890s, they had a civic revival. So they had the creation of the Boys and Girls Scouts, the Boys and Girls Clubs, the Settlement House Movement, the temperance movement, the environmental movement, the NAACP, the unions. Basically, they realized all of our institutions are built for raising kids on the prairie in Kansas, but we got a million kids in New York and Chicago and Philadelphia. So you had cultural, civic, and then eventually they said political, which was the progressive movement. And so I think that's roughly the order it has to go in. There has to be a shift in mind, a civic renaissance, which is what we're in the middle of right now, and then the politics can happen. I don't think, believe me, I cover politicians they are so far behind, there's, there's never going to be a transformation at that level. And so, but I, I do spend a lot of time thinking about how do you get cultural change to translate into systems change? And I really don't think you can do that until you have common consciousness and a shifted consciousness. In 1960, nobody called themselves a feminist. By 1975, tens of millions of people called themselves feminists. There was great power in that identity. The weird problem is here is we have got a social isolation problem and we have no community movement, and no sense of what does it mean to live in a different way of life, to have different values. And so that's my little role, is to try to pump that up. And I think that's the only way we can do it. You right here? Yeah. There's a mic right there. Uh, you, had, you had mentioned that there was the boy that asked the mother if he could hold her child, and then he asked her, if you've never had love, can you be a father? Can you give love? And you didn't answer. And I was curious oh. what she answered him. You know, I, I should ask her. I don't know. <laughs> I thought the question itself was so sad. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll come back with the answer. You know, there's a lot of research on this. If, um, attachment research, you probably know, at 18 months, you can tell a lot about a kid. But one of the things we learned from that research is it's never too late. And that if, if you take a kid who's got a, a, a not a great attachment pattern 18 months and you give a loving mentor, a loving parent to that kid, the brain changes. Right. Yeah. That, I just, I, I, one of my friends said something very profound. Uh, she said, we were all missing something as children, and as adults, we're all, we're all willing to put up with a lot in order to get it. <laughs> Which I thought, wow, that's deep. <laughs> Is there? Yes. Uh, oh, thank yes. you, David. I wonder if you could comment on this. It seems today we have such advances in technology, uh, and I wonder if you could comment on whether our communication skills have increased or decreased as a result of those? Yeah, well, um, I mentioned that statistic, which I think is one of the most stunning statistics of our moment, that teenage suicide rates are going up by 70%. And uh, if, if you go to campus these days and you ask anybody on campus, how are your mental health facilities doing? They're all just swamped. And I think part of that is growing up in this meritocratic system, these lies I described, but I think a lot of it is just the smartphone. Uh, partly the addiction technology, partly comparison. They're always comparing themselves. Partly a, a psychologist said to me, I don't know about this theory, she said, on social media they all have many different personas, none of which is their real persona. That has some validity, it sounds a little uh, valid to me. So I don't see how you get such rapid social change without the, the existence of the smartphone. Uh, and we, we were too innocent, we thought communication would make us all friends. But, you know, as Neil Ferguson, the historian, says, when the printing press happened, they thought it would also have the same, oh, look, we can write books to each other, we'll all communicate, well, peace in our time. And they had 300 years of vicious religious war. So hopefully we'll escape that one. <laughs> really cheering us up here. <laughs> you talked about the value of unheeded time in childhood. How can we get parents and the culture to believe in the value of unheeded time. Yeah. No, it's the value of play and just wonderment. Um, I think about even in my college career, I, uh, this is uh, such a dweeby answer and I'm wandering into space, but uh, I, I learned a lot from my lectures, but I really just wandered around the library. And as a kid, we had free range of Manhattan starting in second grade. We all, I went to Grace Church School on 7th and Broadway, or 12th, 10th Street and Broadway. And they just let us roam there uh, and now you would never do that with a seven-year-old. And so the amount of unstructured, supervised time for 15-year-olds, I can't remember the exact number, but it's gone down by like something like 70%. And I'm as bad as everybody else. <laughs> uh, but um, somehow we have to, the problem is you can't unilaterally disarm from the meritocracy. Because you feel like if you don't pressure your kid, into having the perfect resume, then the other parents certainly are not gonna stop. And so we're all locked into this arms race. Um, and that's why I don't think the meritocracy gets enough crap. I think we should be more critical of it, uh, which I tried to be. Hi, I, I really enjoyed uh, listening to you. I'm your contemporary. And uh, I think when you and I grew up, it certainly was a much different place in the 60s. Uh, when Martin died and Bobby was shot, I didn't think the world could get any worse. I mean, I just, when Bobby was gone, that was the end of hope, so to speak. I'm now living in a time where I'm kind of glad I'm older. I'm scared for my children, for my grandchildren. And I see society as just, your point is well taken that if everybody changes and has tries to have better meaning in their lives and so on, things will change, but it just seems to be going totally in the opposite direction. I've been attending these lectures and so on for years, and the one thing I realize currently, and I, I, I notice amongst all the people that I've heard speak, is that they all try to leave the audience with a bit of optimism, which now seems to be missing. So glad I came tonight, this is great. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, uh, th my optimism is, is unfeigned, it's real. And I say that for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, when you look back at social science and a lot of people who do writing like me, it's always too pessimistic. You, people basically figure stuff out. 
And so there's a woman, I think at Williams, who is a social theorist who has a theory that history moves forward by the ratchet, hatchet, pivot, ratchet process. History, we have a problem, we confront a problem. And we figure it out. We develop a, cu a culture around that problem. And it works for a while. And, but then it stops working. And you have to chop it up. And those moments where you have to chop it up, the hatchet phase can be bumpy. 1968, now, 1848, 1905. But pe then people figure stuff out and they pivot over and they ratchet up again. So for example, to stick with New York, in the 1950s, we had a very communal culture in New York and around the country. If, like, if you grew up in Chicago, you didn't say, I'm from Chicago, you said, I'm from 59th and Pulaski. Because you had these tight streetscapes, there was no TV, so the kids were running in and out. It was very communal, and it helped them solve the big challenges of that time, which was like the Depression, winning World War II, industrialization. But then it got stifling. It tolerated too much anti-Semitism, too much racism, too much sexism. So it had to be chopped up. And the 60s were a period where it was chopped up. And you can see a shift in culture in one of the great moments of my childhood, which was Super Bowl III. If anybody remembers, it was the Baltimore Colts against the New York Jets. And on one side of the fall, there were two quarterbacks at the end of that game who both grew up within miles of each other in Western Pennsylvania, but 10 years apart. One of them was Johnny Unitas, crew cut 1950s guy, really boring, really good, but really boring. You know, high top sneakers. Uh, on the other side was my childhood hero, Broadway Joe Namath. Long hair, $5,000 for a coat, swinger. His memoir was called, I can't wait until tomorrow because I get better looking every day. <laughs> and so, so that to me sh symbolized the shift from the culture of the 50s to 60s. And we figured stuff out and then we had, we made some progress on feminism and civil rights. We have the creative rebel economy that gave us Silicon Valley. And now we've had 60 years of hyper individualism. We've kind of run out the string on it. And so we have to shift over to something else. What I've tried to paint here is an ethos built on commitment making and relationalism. And that's what I think we have to shift over to, which is why I wrote the book. I think it's a wonderful message and the uh, s opposition to hyper-individualism, personally for me anyway, began with uh, the Bowling Alone book. Yeah. And uh, your, I think your recipe for re confronting it is far richer and more meaningful, I think, than what uh, uh, Bowling Alone was able to do. But what I'm concerned about is the s extra stress on society from extraordinary climate change and hyper-nationalism, both of which may kind of outrun the good impulse to try to organize society more uh, egalitarianly. So I I'm interested in your view on whether those external stresses are, we're going to be able to withstand them. Yeah, I've, um, I'm busy enough saving America's soul, climate change. I'm <laughs> Uh, I'm giving that one to Tom Friedman, he can have that one. Uh, I, I will say something about nationalism, because I used to be, I was a foreign correspondent for the Wall Street Journal in the late 90s, uh, and uh, I covered nothing but, or in the early 90s, I covered nothing but good events. Nelson Mandela coming out of prison, the Oslo peace process in the Middle East, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of communism, uh, unification of Europe, everything seemed to be going great, barriers falling, people coming together. And then at the end, I covered one event which I barely paid attention to, which was the Yugoslav Civil War. And now when I look back, I think that was the most important event I covered because the ensuing 25 or 30 years has been about ethnic nationalism, strongman division. And but I think that maybe, maybe I'm monomaniacal. I, sp I spent a lot of time, I wrote about 37 columns in 2015 saying, don't worry, Donald Trump will never get the Republican nomination. Don't, that will never happen. And so after I was wrong, I spent a year in Trump country. And the people who voted for Trump, they were fine. The median income was 74,000. Their communities were collapsing. And so when you, when you looked at them, they were isolated and alone. And what, ha what do human beings do when they're isolated and alone? They do what their evolutionary roots tell them to do. They revert to tribe. And tribalism seems like a form of community, but it's really the dark twin of community because it's not based on mutual affection, it's based on common hatreds. And so that's what Fox News does. And so to me, the tribalism is also a result of the social isolation. Let's do one more question over here. Hi, Mr. David Brooks. Um, I was hoping you could speak a little bit about how the world has become so informal 
um, as someone who shows up to a top 10 law firm in joggers and no socks every day, <laughs> it just seems like it's nothing like kind of like at the end of 12 Angry Men when the guy's like, I used to call my father, yes, sir. And, you know, it just seems like there's all these people nowadays and there's not as much respect for authority. And in some ways it's good, right? It bridges the gap. It allows us to get to know people better. But sometimes when your guard is so far down, it's very challenging to establish a meaningful relationship out of respect and love. Yeah. Well, I will say um, I try not to wear a suit. I'm wearing one tonight, but so I, I'm not the best spokesman here. Um, but a couple of things. We need good leaders. We also need good followers some of the time and somebody willing to pay deference to uh, institutions they, end, they uh, enter. Uh, I I'm only can quote a, a friend of mine named Yuval Levin, who has a book coming out later in the years, one of the smartest young, um, or smartest writers period in America. And he says, which I agree with, that we're formed by institutions. When we are born, we're not born into a green space. We're born into a world peopled with institutions. And the why. Judaism, Christianity, Central Park, <laughs> whatever you want it to be. And those institutions form us. They hold out certain standards. There's a book called The Lost Lawyer uh, by a guy named Tony uh, Rockman, who says when you were a lawyer, there were certain standards of how you were supposed to be as a lawyer. You did public service, you behaved formally, you tried to be reserved and unemotional to show how broad-minded you were and how much you could be trusted. And so you go into that firm and you try to live up to that standards. You take the firm uh, and you try to steward it, any organization we're part of for a little while. And then you try to pass it along better than we're f you found it. And that's an institutional mindset. He says, Yuval says that our institutions used to be formative of us, but now they're performative. We're, we perform on them. We use our institutions to make this a case for ourselves. And if you want an example, look at the U.S. Senate. People used to go to the Senate to serve the Senate. They believed in the Senate, the rules of the Senate. Now they go so they can write books and be on TV. And at the process, they basically are wrecking the institution. And so that loss of institutional space. I had a friend who had a kid who, who got bloodied and had to take him to the emergency room, and he was in the hospital for a few days. And over the next uh, week, a lot of people came to visit. And at the end of the week, he realized Everybody I know who came, came because I had some institutional tie with them. They go to church with me. They work in my office. They're in the same little league as me. It is our institutions that really hold us together. And the weakness of our institutions is as strong as any other weakness uh, in society. Let me end finally. I really do believe that we figure stuff out. There is really not another decade I would like to go back to. The late 60s, those of us who grew up in this city, you remember what the subways looked like? <laughs> there was a guy, this is horrible to mention, a friend of mine found a, a story uh, about, on the Upper West Side, there was, a, a, this is horrible to say, but a serial castrator, a kid who was taking kids into Central Park and castrating them. And it happened so often, but the, there was so much crime and violence and disorder, it wasn't even a big thing. People had gotten used to the violence. And we figured that out somehow. And I, we don't know why, but I have to think a lot of kids growing up said, I'm not going to wind up like, on crack like my older brother. So people do have a way of figuring stuff out. And at the Nader is the moment of great possibility. A lot of the greatest companies of the 1950s were created in 1932 at the bottom of the Depression. And I keep going back to this valley and redemption. And that's the story of all great religions. It's a story of a lot of great lives, and it'll be our national story. Thank you.